I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, chief cat herder, and host. And I'm delighted to welcome you all for a really, really important hour today. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome two faculty members from California, two experts on, among other things, Asian American women in the academy. Uh, we have two great professors. I'm going to bring them up uh, in the order they appear on this slide. Uh, so first, let me bring up Professor Wei Ming Dariatis, coming to you from San Francisco State University. Hello, Wei Ming. Hi. Hi, Brian. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. you know, Thank you. I I, I'm, I'm in awe of the amount of work you do and the amount of ideas that you address. And rather than ranting and raving about you for 10 minutes while you glow, let me ask you instead to introduce you by telling us what are you going to be working on for the next academic year? What are the major topics, the major projects that are uppermost in your mind? So um, for the next year, I'll be continuing my work as the faculty director for San Francisco State University's Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching mm -hmm. and Learning. Um, I am a professor of Asian American Studies, but I have moved over to this uh, semi-administrative role for the time being. And around May, we realized that we really needed to support faculty not only in being able to teach online, but to teach online with justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion uppermost in their um, pedagogies of inclusive excellence. So I use, those are our terms that we use, and um, that spells out Jedi Pi. So we created a Jedi Pi Institute. My husband has threatened to actually bake a Jedi Pi for me. At some <laughs> I don't know what that will look like. Um, and we currently have 200 faculty enrolled in the fall Jedi Pi, and we put through over 100 in the summer Jedi Pi. It's an intensive operation. Um, we've also, I have personally been consulting with um, deans across campuses, department chairs across campus to support them to create a more equitable and frankly, specifically anti-racist Mm -hmm. approach. Um, the College of Science and Engineering is actually the first one to decide they want to create an anti-racism task force on our campus. So I've been consulting mm -hmm. with, with that dean um, and so many individual departments in places that you might not expect, like geography, are trying to address anti-racism uh, in their, not only in their teaching, but also in their um, interactions with one another which I think is so powerful that it's being looked at holistically. The other, um, among many other things, <laughs> my other major project is going to be a task force on teaching effectiveness assessment, which on the surface of it might not seem to be so critically urgent at this moment in time, but I think is actually the key to making huge shifts in our culture as a campus and indeed as um, perhaps even a university system, the California State University system. And that is because although it might start with teaching effectiveness assessment and frustrations that faculty have with the over-reliance on basically a little more than a student rating system of faculty, it's basically like Yelp, right? <laughs> Rate my professor. Um, and we rely on those numbers for really important decisions in retention and promotion when we probably shouldn't be, uh, I would say definitely shouldn't be. And number one, we're not actually assessing for our desired outcome. We assess students for their, for their desired learning outcomes, but we don't assess faculty for, their, for the desired outcomes that we have. Um, our campus's primary goal is social justice through education. Nowhere in any of our assessments do we actually ask about that. Ah. So that's going to be a big move, uh, push for me. And then I also, um, I edit our pedagogy newsletter, CETL Circles, which you can find on the CETL website. We have back issues um, and we publish about one issue a, a month. Wow. 
I, I mean, I'm delighted that you've mastered the science of cloning because there's clearly five or six of you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, that gives us, all of us, uh, a good introduction into you um, and, and your work. Um, let me um, uh, bring up your co-author uh, or co-editor as well. Um, let me bring up uh, Carolyn uh, Culo Valverde. So let me see if I can get this up right. One more button to press, and here we go. Hi. <laughs> Greetings. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. I have to ask. I have to ask again. This is the same question, so I'm I'm, I'm guilty of repetition here. But mm -hmm. you are you also have so much work, so much going on, so many ideas, so many projects. Let me just if you could introduce yourself to people by telling. What are you going to be working on for the next academic year? What are the big projects, the big ideas? Um, what's uppermost in your mind? So I'm actually a, a trained political scientist, so I'll continue my work on looking at alternative sustainable development um, in Asia and, and diaspora connections, uh, focusing on Vietnam. And I, I also am founding director of a new Vietnam Studies initiative where we look at contemporary issues and youth culture. So I'll definitely be continuing with that. Um, but in terms of um, higher ed, you know, it, I came into it as a calling because, you know, I and Weiming and others, we suffered through it in so many ways. And so, you know, what started as a movement that led to this um, um, text, uh, you know, I will continue with that. So we'll continue to um, to support individuals. I, you know, I joke that, you know, we're like run the Harriet Tedman of, you know, academia and and certainly will continue to support individuals as they came in, as they come in. And, you know, um, we initially had uh, Asian American women then it became Asian American men, then it became like more Latino men's, then became white women. And, you know, we expect to have uh, white men next to ask for assistance around issues of tenure, because as our book mentioned, you know, this is a systemic problem that, um, you know, is about the institution um, and, and how individuals are treated, um, you know, and oftentimes based on race and gender, but we're all going to, you know, suffer um, in that. So in future, in, in, in future projects, um, I'm going to be looking at the institute institutionalized activism of faculty and students, in particular weaponizing of students to target dissenting professors, which is something that has been observed for some time. And it's going into full swing with various um, uh, faculty members that have been dismissed from their universities in, um, in these particular strategies that are insidious. And of course, um, I've um, been teaching since the beginning of COVID and through COVID. And so um, we, you know, everything I teach now is in presence of COVID and Black Lives Matter. So um, definitely these events have, um, you know, been a catalyst of what we felt was going to happen all along in your works with future trends. You understand this all too well. And so, um, you know, I definitely will be um, uh, uh, doing the, you know, the observing and also the research and, and, and teaching around these issues as they're relevant because our students are and faculty are, are definitely in, in the midst of this. And so how will university look as we emerge from this. Fantastic. Uh, again, another, the two of you have mastered cloning at an epic scale. Um, <laughs> so if um, uh, I'm, I'm impressed at the variety of your work and I promise I will, I will follow up on questions of, uh, of uh, Vietnamese politics after this. <laughs> I did want to just check in with both of you first. Uh, since you were in California, are both of you healthy in terms of COVID and safe from ash and fire right now? There is quite a bit of ash in the air. Um, my garden is covered <laughs> right oh, now. Oh. Yeah, so it is, uh, it's, we're just inside with all the windows shut and all of our um, HEPA filters on, something that yeah. most Californians have had to invest in if they can afford them. Yeah. Lucky, privileged to have that resource. Yeah, um, I think, you know, aside from the physical and environmental dangers, there's then this um, visual psychological impact where our skies are orange. And so it really feels like the apocalypse, you know, it really feels like um, things are dire. And so um, that's definitely has its effect. And all through this, of course, it's been, um, you know, financially, you know, spiritually, and certainly psychologically, um, you, you know, detrimental to so many of us. No, I'm, I, it's it's a terrible story, and my my sympathies go out to both of you, as well as to anybody involved in this conversation who is uh, based in California or in Oregon, which is also uh, 
uh, baking in, in Flint. Um, I, I invited you both here in part because I learned about your book. And here is uh, visual proof, uh, Fight the Tower, which is an incredible title. Um, and it's an amazing, amazing book. Uh, you should have on the bottom left of your screen, there's a kind of yellow orange colored button, and that'll take you to the uh, Rutgers Publishing um, page for this. So you can, I'm blown away by this book because among other things, you have such a huge variety of topics, everything from, uh, well, as you just said now, psychological and spiritual issues to questions of tenure, to questions of publication, to micropolitics within departments, to the larger interracial within the Asian diaspora politics. And you also have so many different Asian nations represented, everything from the Philippines, uh, the great chapter on Pine, uh people to uh, Vietnam, to China, to Japan. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, and there's a wonderful chapter on the Hmong people, which I really, really uh, heartened to see. Uh, so first of all, this is just recommendation, of course, get this book, grab it as soon as you can. Um, and I have so many questions, but friends, if you're new to the forum, please know this is not a traditional interview in that I'm sitting here and interviewing our two wonderful guests. The questions that are the best, the comments that are the best, come from all of you. So I'm just going to start off with a couple of quick questions, but I really, really want to hear from all of you. So again, if you're new, just remember the bottom of the screen, there's a raised hand button if you want to join us on stage. And there's also the question mark button if you'd like to just type in uh, a comment or a question. Uh, so my, my first question, this is a really basic question. Um, what have you learned from your audiences and readers? What kind of feedback have you gotten from folks? You want to start winning? Sure. I mean, the first feedback that we usually get is tears. Oh. It is uh, the feeling of um, authentication. You know, mm -hmm. I thought I was the only one. There's a great deal of isolation that people experience because the overarching uh, message of the book is academia is not a meritocracy. Unfortunately, Asian American women Perhaps um, as among um, you know all people of color, I think Asian Americans more than other people of color buy the myth that academia is a meritocracy. Um, and that has to do with our position uh, in terms of being, you know, this quote unquote model minority myth, where we're always told we're good at school. Uh, school is the pathway to success and education. You know, that is something that uh, a lot of East Asians really emphasize because it comes from our uh, own historical and cultural background. Sure. And so there's this emphasis on education as being a neutral experience, as a merit-based experience, and one in which you will succeed. And indeed, many Asian American women experience that at least up until graduate school. Hmm. At which point they then might start to experience um, harassment. They might start to experience, as we actually have a couple of, um, of graduate students' uh, narratives represented in the book. So they describe their experiences in graduate school. Um, we have one undergraduate. I was really pleased that we, we were able to get one undergraduate to oh, actually share. Oh, you're right, to, 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 to share their experiences about um, you know, being undergraduate Asian American women. Um, but we, what we see is that by the time Asian American women enter into academe as professionals, they may have just then started to realize that, in fact, it is not a merit-based system. Or the image that we use in the book, because we were both, you know, huge Star, Star Wars nerds, is um, it's that moment that you realize, wait, that's that's no moon, that's that's the Death Star, <laughs> and we trapped in its tractor beam already. Um, and that was the hugest thing is that people don't realize that it's actually in some ways, not only just as, but perhaps even more of a, an intersectionally racist and, um, and sexist system that they've entered into. And it's a deeply hierarchical system, sure. which is also, I believe, at odds with how most of us imagined academia would be. We thought it's our intellectual freedom, it's academic freedom, it's freedom, and it's not freedom. It is the opposite of that. Wow. Yeah. I love that you have tears of recognition 
uh, that speaks so well to the power of your book and what you've achieved with that. Um, do I have the numbers right that in American higher education, about 3% of the faculty are Asian American women? Kulin, do you want to do this? Or yeah, um, yeah. It's, it actually you start out about um, you know we we're we're I guess well represented in higher ed, but then by the time we're in um, getting tenure track positions, we're maybe at six percent. But by the time we um, go into tenure, we're less than two percent, yeah. and um, and then moving up, you know, it's it's even less than that. So what it says is like there is no door or window for Asian American women. OK, and um, and this is actually starts even in undergrad years. You know, we, are, we have grad students and undergrad represented. But, you know, a study done, done by um, Catherine um, uh, Milkman et al. Um, looked uh, sent 600 and I'm sorry, 6,500 letters to 85 different universities. And um, and the only thing they changed. OK, and these are letters that undergrads write to professors to for mentorship, to moving towards grad school in their careers. And they use, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of. Uh, Asian, Native, Black, Latino sounding names and white sounding names. And of course, white men receive the, the quickest and the most responses. But what was shocking, even for the researchers, that Asian American women were the least likely to receive responses and in the slowest amount of time from social science, humanities, all the way to STEM. And so, um, you know, that 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 we are we are simply um, you know, shining light on these statistics, and they're abysmal to say the least, right? And in in and then you juxtapose it to what Wei Ming was talking about is this idea of what we term a privileged oppress, because we're perceived as like this honorary white privileged group. You know, lay low and you'll get all these things you needed. But actually, we are we are by far the easiest to discard, dismiss, and mm -hmm. and stopped at every corner. And so, what you know, aside from the testimonials and and the the, um, and the tears that come about uh, from the those who you know to get back to your question um, of those who receive our book, um, you know we're in the heels of presuming competent incompetent, which is another great seminal piece, um, um, edited anthology that was the first of its kind looking at women of color, um, saying that, you know, this is what's happening. It's an epidemic. It's not an isolated incident. We're not isolated. We are made isolated. We are feeling we're in solitary as we're dealing with this, but in fact, it's a phenomenon. And so we're in the heels of that. And what our book attempts to do is, um, you know, once you have those tears and then once you, once you realize you're not alone, which Zuma Compton offered, um, you know, uh, fight the tower says, then are you ready to fight? You know, now now is the time to fight. And so what we offer is empirical research and data to say, um, in fact, um, you know, you're not alone. And um, and that is not, you know, um, she said, she said, what have you, and that um, there's actually evidential material. I mean, the chapter that I, I wrote, for example, you know, it's called Killing Machine. Mm -hmm. And um, we, you know, um, surveyed 400 individuals and actually in in a four day um, survey and the survey is quite long. It's like three, 30 minutes long. We sent it out to women in academia and we uh, immediately got over 200 responses. And they and they even said they wanted to respond more. And we aggregated about 200, just less than um, 200 of these numbers of Asian American women. And 75 percent, that's three in four Asian American women, said that they are suffering through um, health issues, even chronic health issues that they attribute to the hostile environment of the university. Mm -hmm. So you sure. think about, yeah, you think about the workplace, you know, if you have three in four people experiencing health issues yeah. and, you know, and we wrote this in part, you know, because um, we we were suffering health issues. You know, I had a near death experience, for example, and then others died. I, I was the lucky one. So, you know, we have poems by um, WP talking mm -hmm. about um, Su Fak Fang, who, uh, you know, died of cancer. And so we know research shows that um, through uh, you know, um, stress creates, you know, um, immune, your immune system is, is jeopardized. And then, you know, all these diseases come in. And so, you know, cancer is one of them. So we also wrote this book because there's so many that don't have a voice, even, you know, they're not here with us today. So it is a very, very real issue. It's not us whining about, you know, tenure or not tenure. It's, it's life or death. And that's why we were so moved to to write this book. And we are moved to be able to read it. Um, thank you. I, I'm that's that's an impressive reaction. 
friends, I have a few more questions I'd like to ask, but again, uh, I'd really like to hear from all of you. Um, so if you would like to uh, uh, take the stage, just press the raise hand button uh, and uh, I can beam you up. Uh, and if you'd like instead to uh, type in a question, just go to that question mark button uh, and type in a question or a comment and uh, we'll be glad to relay that. Um, I, I, I have so many other questions. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if uh, Carolyn, if I, could, if I could focus on you for a second. Um, you mentioned the model minority problem and, and this is uh, specific to Asian Americans as the uh, non-white population that uh, excels uh, on all kinds of metrics. Um, and yet this has uh, a dark side to it, if I can pick up yeah. your story's metaphor. Um, yeah. Can you speak to the model minority problem for Asian American yeah. women in the academy? Absolutely. I think what, um, you know, I want to even get it in deeper, if you don't mind, which is, you know, uh, what brings what makes our book unique is that we make the claim that, um, you know, race and racial oppression and, and or gender oppression, etc. was really, um, um, you know, socially constructed, um, engineered, if you will, by those who wanted to make sure um, that at that as they create these institutions that are unfair, unjust, and that you know extracts resources, that they keep us from each other. They keep us from each other. Okay. So the civil rights movement really was. Um, I mean, we 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 go back quite far in history, but let's just take the civil rights movement at, at a, as a as a point where we came together and said no more for you know for laborers, no more for you know African Americans, you know Latinos and Asians, etc. And we came together, and so um, you know it became really. Um, a nuisance for those in power, if you will. Um, and so they had to sort of engineer and socially construct new ways um, to create difference between us. And so that was really the beginning of the model minority myth. They or they took, I believe, um, Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II and were so frightened by that awful experience of in which their lands and property and lives and and you know, reputation, everything was stripped from them forever. Um, they took that population that was so keen at that point to assimilate and not ever again to be targeted as as the as the alien other or as a traitor. And you know, they married out at eighty percent rate um, in in, wow. in many in many instances. Um, that's just wow. one example. So they targeted this group to say, "Well, look at this model minority. They're so docile. They're so nice, and their kids are doing so well. They're all these valedictorian." And we can attribute that to, say, Confucian values, et cetera, et cetera. Why can't you, African Americans, uh, you Latinos, you know, with those kind of stereotypes around, you know, not, not, you know, violent or uh, lazy, et cetera? Why don't you do as well? And so the first group, obviously, you know, were like, mm, I don't know. But then um, over time, um, through generations, and when you target a group that was made so vulnerable through a psychological and physical, you know, oppression. Um, then, you know, they started to internalize that. And then you have several generations down the line. They don't even see anything different. I mean, I get students that absolutely uh, uh, adhere to the model minority myth and they believe it and they don't and they wonder why others are not. And this so you have to say through the social engineering project and construction of difference, they, you, you know, those in power were, uh, were very successful, you know, but it doesn't speak to the reality of us seeing, uh, you know, us here, for example, that have values around education. You're here to, you know, uh, to promote the, these ideas with us here. So it's not it's not so much about race or gender that makes us different. It's how we were constructed so different and given little pieces of the pie so we can go, oh, okay, we're okay, we're okay. And so what Weiming and I brought, are bringing up is you tell this to a population and such as, you know, um, aggregate a little bit more to Asian American women. And so we internalize it, we believe it. What happens when that you know, the tenure statistic comes around and we don't get tenure, even when we've done everything right, done maybe triple, quadruple the work and we don't get tenure. What does it say to our reality? It says that everything we've been brought up with for generations is a lie. It's an absolute lie. So what does that do to, you know, oneself? And so the, the, the answer is not to say, oh, it's this, you know, race, group, gender that is a problem. It's the institution. It's how things are set up. It's how the narrative has been so powerful and strong that, you know, it's set to follow generations after us if we don't speak up. 
And that's what we're doing. And and the other thing we, we you know we say fight the tower. We're not talking about this moment. We are in the heels of a history of women who have fought for us. You know they include um, you know. Uh, 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 Tongue, for example, and 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 Wang and others, um, for for example, and and um, for for example, in 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 Penn in um, Penn University, uh, Penn, uh, uh, I'm sorry, University of Pennsylvania, Rosalie Tongue, who was going, you know, was um, more than qualified um, in her um, school of business um, uh, to be promoted, but she was not, and she was harassed in, in so many ways, and um, it, you know, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Okay, um, Ken Starr was actually, uh, you know, her, her counsel, and um, and and and. You know, she she won. Um, you know, was overwhelming evidence, and she opened up, her her case set precedents that now all tenure cases are able to review their cases before it was closed, and now is much more transparent. So, in the heels of Rosalie Tung and Asian American women, American woman fighting for tenure, we now have tenure cases open, and you know, Jane Jew at at. Uh, you know, in Iowa, Marcy Wong in in Berkeley, um, and and even Don Nakanishi, who's a male Asian American, um, at UCLA, who has you know been instrumental in support of this. You know, we had a meeting several years back at the Asian American Studies Conference where there was four women. Four of them are you know um, some of them were participants in our book now. And he said, man, you know, thirty years ago there was also four phenomenal women you know fighting for ten. Mm -hmm and making headway and here we are 30 years 40 years later and um and we're doing the same thing you know so it is to say that there is history behind this we want to you know let that be known that we have always fought we are not these docile asian american women that we saw injustice and our acts have made a dis difference in academia and we want to continue to do so and so that that's you know part of what we're trying to do here and you want to continue to fight. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, Questions are coming in. And at the same time, uh, Wei Ming is, I think, six people. I think I underestimated because the sixth person is now taking over the chat and giving you all kinds of great information. Um, so please, uh, um, if, if you want, I'll try and recopy that later on. But it's really, really good stuff. We have questions coming in from all kinds of folks. And I want to bring up one from uh, uh, the awesome Stephen Downs, who argues or asks, is your sense that this is a U.S. problem or a global problem? Uh, uh, who wants to take that first? I, I'll take a little stab at it. So that's a that's a really important question. And um, one of the things that we feature, we actually have a an Asian international woman scholar, Akiko Takayama, describing her experience. And one of the things that is challenging, of course, is that for Asian international scholars, and just to be clear, the national data does not disaggregate between Asian and Asian American, which mm -hmm. is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're always seen as perpetual foreigners anyway, so what difference does it make? But in fact, we have quite different experiences. Asian international scholars, when they come here, they don't, they often have not experienced being a minority before. Yeah, yeah. Let I me mean, just be really clear about that, right? They may be perceived as Asian women in an international context, in their in their home nations, um, in their in their interactions with people on you know in a in a global context, but but they have not experienced being a minority before. And what I mean by minority is not numerical, but of course I mean a structural minority, somebody who has lack of access to power. Asian international scholars we found have absolutely almost zero. We could not find any research about them. There is no concern about them, even though they, I think, make up a pretty significant uh, percentage of uh, the diversity of Asian uh, American scholars in, in our systems. They also face uh, specific issues. Often their, their university holds their visa. Their university often holds their housing. So they therefore are more vulnerable and are seen as more vulnerable and are therefore more likely to be harassed. And I mean, a lot of what we found is that Asian American women in academia, because they are seen as uh, hypersexualized, mm -hmm. I call out to my colleague, Soline uh, Perenia Shimizu and her book, The Hypersexualization of Race, mm -hmm. uh, that delineates the way that Asian American women are uh, hypersexualized. 
and hyper feminized, which means they're not just sexualized, but they're sexualized as passive, weak, and victim, victimizable. Um, and then further, th since they are in this dependent, extra dependent position on their university, so if they like don't make tenure, they lose their visa, right? That is such a serious thing to, to consider. Um, if they experience problems, uh, their their housing may be threatened, right? If they if they protest being harassed or um, you know sexually harassed, to be very explicit, and that was something that we've seen in a lot of the cases that Asian American women experience the problems they experience with tenure and promotion are often because they've been sexually harassed and they have rebuffed the advances of their department chair or by powerful members of their um, departments or committees. And they have no recourse. Um, further, Asian international scholars, if they're not US citizens, um, there are certain grants that they cannot be, um, you know, the primary investigator on, yeah. the yeah. investigator and that will impact their tenure and promotion. And then the last, but really important thing is language and language discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, so not only are they experiencing bias in student evaluations, which is the obvious one, they often will also experience bias from their colleagues. We had, we had a case at San Francisco State, it never became a case, it just disappeared when the faculty member disappeared. But we had an Asian international woman scholar in a field that was based on her cultural background. I'll try not to be more explicit than that. A field that was based on her cultural background. She was denied tenure and promotion in her department. She disappeared, she left the university. When people in her department who were all white men uh, who were left were asked, why didn't she uh, get tenured and promoted in your department? They said, she couldn't write. She couldn't write. So here we have you know, people who are invited in, presumably because they have strengths, they have connections. Yeah. But then the challenge is that everybody knows that they were going to face all along are not supported in any way. Wait, They're not getting any kind of support. Let me just pause you for a second. Um, the ask her this question, which is a great question, wanted to just clarify. Uh, he was thinking about, is there, um, is there, do you have a sense of this in the international scene? i.e. is this a problem, is this the same kind of problem in Europe or is this the same kind of problem in Canada or Mexico, for example? Uh, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> right. So especially in, uh, you know, like white European dominated countries, like you said, Canada, um, in Europe, we see the same problems. The difference is that um, more often the, the immigrant populations are a little bit more recent. And so mm -hmm. they might not necessarily have the same, um, historical background that uh, like populations in the U.S. have. And also here in the U.S., I think Asian, the Asian American movement in, was very, had been very intimately tied with um, black liberation movements mm -hmm. and uh, other communities of color that have been working together in allyship. And in places where you might not have that in the same way, it's different. Um, inter the, the other component of the international scene that I think is really important to mention is the places where Asians were imported as settler col uh, colonialists. And so we look at Hawaii as an example of that, but we can also look at places like Fiji, you know, and um, I, I've been working with a graduate student who's, who's looking specifically at Indo-Fijian women in yeah. <laughs> right? So there are very specific populations where Asians are, we call, we call it a tertiary migration pattern, right? Where they were moved from somewhere in Asia through co European colonialism to, say, an island in the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, and then maybe they have moved here. But during that, when they're in that island in the Caribbean, they are often put into a middle um, um a middle person a minority buffer position hmm. to buffer between the colonialists and the colonized or the African imported enslaved people. And Lisa Lowe has quite a, a really useful analysis of this called The Intimacies of Four Continents, which I recommend. Yeah. That's a great title.
Yeah, um, to jump onto that, I, I wanna, there's um, two answers. One uh, immediately is during COVID, my, my international students and Asian American students have felt very acutely, um, you know, what's going on, um, you know, around discrimination. Um, you know, what the administration and others in the government are calling this um, the, the Chinese, um, you know, flu, et cetera. And so um, my, the, the Asian American and international students have been harassed, have been attacked. There's, you know, websites up and, and you know, there's the highest number of reported of incidences around COVID is being attacked. So this goes back to like Vincent Chin and others mm -hmm. where, you know, um, you're misidentified and, and, and so on. And it also goes back to this idea that, well, if Asian Americans or Asians are doing so well in the academy, you know, how are they still vulnerable to these things? Because this is happening in universities, it's happening in university towns. And, um, and so they're made, especially, you know, vulnerable to this. And, and that's, in, in, in essence, this is the first time these international students have had a semblance of, of discrimination, um, racial discrimination in the United States because they've been told a, a very different story. That's why they decided to come here, internationally speaking. But I wonder too, if the, um, the person in the audience was um, talking about, is this a global problem? And I will say that, you know, a, a, I feel yes, because the institutions that are um, in place and, and particularly um, higher ed is, a, you know, neoliberal model, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, what is happening is that, um, you know, it was already starting to be, you know, the bottom dollar. So it wasn't this idea of education. It wasn't this idea of fairness or meritocracy for a long time now. So, you know, this is happening, you know, across the world in this idea of how are we supposed to treat education, right? Which is now what's happening with COVID because, you know, we're at 75%, 75% um, adjuncts now, you know, contingency um, uh, workers. And so, you know, that group was not supported. That group was not given research money. They're not given, you know, training. They're not giving so many things. And, um, and so that, that the, the edu one's education was already in question. Like what is the value of your education? And also then what is the cost? Then there becomes this cost benefit situation. They're already paying too much. There is this, you know, situation, and that's why we have the Occupy movement, et cetera, right? And that's why we still have protests. That's why, you know, in California in particular, we have graduate students who can't, you know, who don't have enough to eat and yeah. don't have enough to stay. And so this is, this is all in parts and parcel of the liberal, uh, the university, neoliberal uh, uh, university. And, 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 and also that, you know, um, once you have a situation with remote teaching, right? Then students are asking, is this even, and this is even worse, because now you're not getting the tenured professors, you're not getting these um, individuals that, you know, can necessarily teach, you're getting, you know, whatever you're getting, and then you don't have the resources, as Wayming mentioned, the inequality of, you know, uh, uh, tech, but yet they're having to pay all this money that, you know, they're not using the services, but they're not getting tech support. You know, they're not getting allowance for that, for example. So students yeah. are staying outside of, 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 um, of, the few places that have internet access in order to get, you know, to their work. Um, my The international students are, are, you know, if they're at home, they're up all hours in the day to take these classes, you know? And so there's so many things um, going on right now that is of a global scale. COVID, it has united in ways that are uh, both, you know, extraordinarily painful, but also, um, you know, enlightening that it makes us see, okay, now we have to take a mic, you know, a magnifying glass to how education was delivered. And frankly, it was not, you know, students were not getting a, you know, a proper education and they were having to pay, you know, through the nose for this, you know, substandard education because, Money's going elsewhere. It's not going to the professors. It's not going to the resources. It's not going to lowering student, you know, fees. And so um, this is made even more pronounced during COVID and 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 remote, you know, teaching learning. You know, teachers also. You know, I I'm, I'm sure women can attest to this. We have had to fight tooth and nail for every resource we've had, you know, get, including computers or chairs or yeah. desks or phones. I mean, these are really basic things that we've had to fight tooth and nail for um, and, and write grants for and beg and start up, you know, um, go fund me or whatever is needed in order to, to be a professor. I, I, well, thank you for saying this. And it also makes me thank uh, uh, Wei Ming because she's in a position now where she can hopefully 
ladle out some of those resources. Uh, um, we have a stack of questions coming up, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance. I, I, I hate to pause you because this is terrific, but I want to make sure that everyone gets to uh, throw in their ideas and questions. Um, here is one. Uh, this is a question here coming from uh, Vassar College. Um, whoop, hang on one second. Um, Bader, oh, hello. Hi there. Can you hear me, Brian? Yes. Um, while, you, while you asked your question, I accidentally uh, knocked Wei Ming off the stage. So let me oh. just bring her up. <laughs> you, go, you go ahead, please. Here and, I, and I can see my big picture. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Hey. Um, so I've, of course, experienced so many, many of these issues through my colleagues and friends at Vassar College. So I, you know, I would think, oh, why is it happening at Vassar? I'm a little bit relieved that it's more widespread, but uh, not that I want Vassar to do the same sort of things, right? Um, my question is of course, sort of personal nature. My wife is Indonesian. I have two in a half Indonesian children. Uh, they're 11th grade and uh, seventh grade. And uh, the older one is starting to, she's on the equity team at school and she's she's very smart. She's doing very well. I'm just wondering if you have any uh, advice or support that I could, that you could channel that what what words of wisdom can i help them navigate what you have already navigated and what has apparently been a, an ongoing struggle for many 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 years for asian american or a, asian women in academia thank you well thank you for your question and, and i want to give two answers to one is um speaking of vassar and other institutions you know um i have to thank uh, personally the women who were involved in this project because they did so at great risk to their career and some of it was quite nascent you know there were undergrads there were graduate students there were untenured professors you know and there were other professors who you know were trying to be promoted and so they did a great risk um to write for us and one of the uh, one of the women who had a huge law case was actually from vassar who ended up not uh, contributing so there were many who were not able to contribute because of that fear as well. We, we're unique into that. We use everyone's names. We didn't do anonymous, though we gave people the option. Um, they felt it was important. And so uh, we thank them for that. So just a shout out to all those that, you know, attempted to, didn't quite make it, you know, and those who um, actually are, are in our anthology. And then the second part is, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I can speak for myself and definitely others because um, I've heard these stories hundreds and hundreds of times is, you know, when we came into the academy, we had this idea that, you know, if we just do our work and do it well, then we get promoted. Right. And I was told early that you have to spend about 70 percent sort of networking and 30 percent your work. And I completely dismiss it. I poo poo. That's beneath me because I'm a scholar. But, you know, in in retrospect, what I've learned is that um, actually you have to be a bit, a bit savvy about how your institution runs. You have to be on committees. You have to talk to people because, frankly, how it exists today and I don't like it, and I like it to be changed is, is who you know. And and um, it's the same with uh, it's a corporation at this point. So simply it's, it's um, who you know, how you get your work out. And so people, you know, um, these committees, promotion, promotional committees, um, or even in your department, if they feel you're a certain way, then you know they may promote you, what have you. And so, in some ways, I would suggest to your wife to um, build allies. I'm not saying brown nose or do things that are you know sort of disingenuous or unauthentic, but I definitely feel that. Um, with everyone who is uh, going up for promotion um, in very various ways. Know how the system works, know how the promotion works, um, know the people involved that could mentor you through that process. Um, I think it's really important. And um, and I will say too, at the end of the day, um, um, I I personally would not advise one to just kind of lay low. And I, and I would say, uh, because if something comes up that doesn't seem right, you should say something too. But two things happens once you say something, you become a target, number one. In almost all the instances of the women that we are affiliated with, um, they said they became a target the moment they defended somebody else. You know, it wasn't even for themselves because they thought they were fine. They saw something going on over there and they brought it up and, uh, and all of a sudden they were not part of the team anymore. And they became a target and then, it, you know, they went down this, you know, a decline, if you will. Um, but but it is Aud what Audre Lorde says, and I wholly believe in it, is that, you know, um, silence would never protect you. So as your wife is going through this, um, you know, speak up for herself and for others and find the evidential materials. Um, take notes. Um, you know, you can almost, you can, I, I don't want to be a naysayer or uh, uh, not optimistic, but you can almost for sure um, uh, expect challenges. And that's putting it mildly. So then, you know, make sure everything is documented, make sure everything is, is um, 
it, you know, is uh, is brought up. Make sure she documents all the people she works with, all the mentorship she does. Uh, document all that, and document if anything weird happens, or document how other people are receiving promotions vis-a-vis. -vis, you know, I mean, in in comparison to, let's say, her promotions, to make sure that it's on balance. Um, definitely uh, build allyships at all levels. Uh, find mentors, and and also be true to oneself when it comes to um, justice. You know, because that's the only time we can really make change. Those are my two cents. I, I don't know if it'd be effective. I can't guarantee one hundred percent, but um, that's a, yeah. that's a fantastic answer. I, I um, Bernard, thank you very much for uh, for asking the question and coming forward. I really well, thank appreciate you for it. hosting this event. Yeah. My pleasure. We we only have five minutes left, um, so I'm going to direct the next question to give uh, Wei Bing first crack at it, um, but uh, also. It's not just one question. We have a stack of questions uh, that all touch on the same thing uh, in different ways. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, let's see. We have one from Sandy uh, who asks about um, uh, Asian American women students who are considering pursuing doctoral degrees and potentially joining academia. But hang on. Um, then at the same time, we have a question uh, from uh, Su Jean Ko. Do you have strategies of resistance for scholars who are pre-tenure or don't have the benefit of tenure? How to resist structures of violence in the academy? And, and at the same time, you see a theme here. Uh, we have a great question. Um, I'm an Asian American woman in the academy and I often find myself the only one in various contexts. How do you develop support networks when in such tokenized contexts? So you see, I mean, these are all survival and fighting practical strategies you know, from grad school on up. Um, <laughs> Wei Ming, do you want to take the first crack at this and uh, and and share some of the advice you learned from this book? So many things. Um, I would say the first bit of advice that I have is something that I learned personally, and that is to build coalitions and relationships with one another because that is how we survive and thrive. I am very fortunate to be um, to have a group of close old friends, women friends from our graduate program at UC Santa Barbara in the English department, who are now all um, teaching or working in administration in academia in the Bay Area. And that has been a really powerful um, force for me personally. We support each other. We, you know, got each other, you know, first jobs. We continue as, you know, to work together as a network and also to, to function as role models. In fact, I interviewed two of these women who, again, I've known since I was 21 or 22 years old. Um, one is a, um, an associate dean at uh, USF, and another is a president of a local community college. And I interviewed them both about their leadership um, and how they became leaders as well as what makes them different as leaders. And that's something that else that we would like to uplift is Asian American women can indeed be leaders. The problem is that they're often not seen as leaders for the same reasons and the same common stereotypes that I mentioned before. We are seen as service providers, we are seen as care workers, but we are not seen as leaders, um, often because we choose to lead in ways that are not recognized uh, according to kind of white male standards or even white female standards of what leadership is. On my own campus in the past couple of years, I've seen, just in, literally in the past two years, I've seen two Asian American women who were in interim dean positions be denied the opportunity to serve um, full time in those positions. And the reasons given were the same, that they weren't seen as leaders because they were perceived as weak or passive. When in fact, the people who work with them were incredibly impressed by the way that they led that they were powerful through support, right? Again, to quote Audre Lorde, um, which was, uh, you know, she was definitely a touchstone for us in writing uh, so much of what we wrote for Fight the Tower. Audre Lorde says, you must redefine power instead of the power to oppress, having the power to oppress, power is actually the res responsibility to support. It's a kind of a reframing. Like if we're gonna not use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house, but we must have power, what is that power going to look like, right? And so me and, and also my colleagues, again, I've been really fortunate in um, my department. We have a, a lot of really powerful women 
uh, colleagues, and we have supported and encouraged one another to seek higher and higher positions of responsibility and power in our university, as well as you know, in our um, academic circles, so that we can be better positioned to support our women uh, graduate students and non-binary graduate students uh, and queer male graduate students and anybody else who is remotely femme in a structure where Asian Americans are al already hyper-feminized. I, I, I want to add one thing real quick um, to uh piggy uh, back on that is yeah. this um uh, you know this um idea of being alone in in you know a sea of folks that don't, don't necessarily look like you how do you find allies to address that question um you know i found the most unlikely allies you know because my perception is that you know if those that look like me have my you know it's my gender um sexual orientation etc they would be uh, there for me and if they have been um you know uh weaponized if they've been a part of this you know um institutionalized activism sort of uh, you know framework then they're not going to be after you they're actually going to be the one that's been you know appropriate to hurt you so you can you will find allies in the unleashed uh, you know un most unlikely places and you will find those who are against you in what you perceive to be a clear safe space you know uh, if you know what i mean so um so understand that you know and 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 know that um we when we come together um in many different ways as we talked about and you know within our circles but also beyond that that's been amazing and that's what this book has has done for me it's expanded my my world so much um mm -hmm. that you know i think i was so very um contained in Asian American studies and, you know, and, and understanding that so many of us in all different, you know, backgrounds have these similar experiences, we're able to have to analyze in a much more broad framework and, and come together as allies. I, I, I have to say with some regret that that is a fantastic point to end our program on. Um, I'm sorry, it was a boo -boo. Somehow <laughs> We are right at the end of the hour. Uh, we have just blazed through this topic. Um, and that's a great uplifting and practical moment. Um, I, we usually end by asking you guys how to keep track with you, how to keep up with you in, in your work. And obviously you can tell the key thing is grab a copy of Fight the Tower, but also uh, how, do we, uh, how do we keep up with your, your new projects and your continued work? I mean, do you have a social media presence? Um, Wei Ming, I think you shared the uh, Jedi Pi um, link uh, in the chat. I yeah, um, I also shared a, a link to Seedle Circles, which I'm publishing about once a month. Sweet. And uh, I'm always including a Jedi Pi conversation now at the end of that. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Thank you. You can find more about me at qling at gmail.com. Um, and mm -hmm. also, I'm sorry. Yeah, you could just email me at qling at gmail.com, which is my name at gmail.com. Or you can also go to qling.com. And then in there, there will be more about me and my projects and also other social media outlets. Um, just that's it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Again, let me, let me thank you both. This is vital work. I'm so thank glad you. that we could share it with uh, with everybody. And thank you both for being so generous with your time. Please both you, stay safe, given this galaxy of... of <laughs> I really appreciate it. But thank don't you, go, everyone. Don't go away, friends. I just want to let you know what's happening for the next few weeks. Uh, again, uh, we are continuing to uh, have sessions that blend in other topics with these questions of race and with COVID. So we have a second session on HyFlex coming up with the inventor of HyFlex. Uh, we have a session on accrediting agencies, a session on accessibility, a session on admissions, and a lot more. Now, uh, if you'd like to go uh, carry on these conversations, if you'd like to share your exploration of, of tactics of how you can best succeed and protect Asian uh, yourself if you're an Asian American woman in the academy, we have lots of different platforms and social media where you can have these conversations. If you'd like to go back into the past and look at some of our sessions that address some of these topics, everything from uh, discrimination by gender to questions of scholarship to questions of adjunct, uh, we have a whole stack of, uh, of previous recordings. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Um, and of course, let me just extend my best wishes to all of you. This is an extraordinary fall semester. We're all under a, a, a complex amount of pressures and stresses. I'm grateful to all of you for spending an hour with us, for thinking together and for sharing with us. Please, all of you, good luck with this semester. Stay safe. I'd love to hear from you. And above all, take care. See you online. Bye-bye.